So, chapter 7, Zebra Steps. So, I'm quickly going to go through the different steps um, of the scripting. And um, <coughs> as I already mentioned, uh, the figure sculpting process uh, has been quite a lot of struggle between um, trying to match the reference in the in the first stage and then uh, trying to match um, more of this uh, classical uh, uh, beauty um, anatomy style that I wanted to have and um, <clears throat> so this is why the the figure is going through a lot of various uh, very odd steps so it all started from this um, um, Excuse me, I lose my word. From this polysphere, sorry. From this, this sphere, uh, this sphere is, is very great to to get um, the shape uh, you want really quick. Um, okay, so first steps. Um, from here, what I did with, is just to generate, um, you, as you probably know, you can generate a skin, which is um, a mesh from a, a Z-sphere. And uh, this is what I did here. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to go through a lot of details about the brush because uh, this is not really what I want to point in this uh, tutorial. This is not a technical uh, approach about ZBrush and uh, maybe at, at some point in the future if if you guys wants me to, to make a, an introduction tutorial maybe I, I'll make one but first I think there is a lot of uh, great um, tutorial about ZBrush out there that you can check and um, and second it's such a huge uh, program with so many things to, to learn that uh, I don't I think it would just uh, be annoying for me to, to enter in a specific detail. So here it is. Second step, which is very, very old. Can I, I recognize that? So I'm going to change my focal lens. Okay. Just so I have something closer to what I wanted to initially. Okay, here it is. So here the idea was to match as close as possible with the correct lighting, which is not this one. Okay, it was kind of something like that. Let me create the second light that I used. Okay, so this was close enough to my reference, which was this one. And um, with the reference on, on the other, other screen, as was, I was trying as much as possible to, to match uh, this. And um, in this kind of um, of sculpting approach, what I try to do is to to reproduce in the brush the, the, the condition of the reference uh, as much as I can. So, for example, here the material is very too very too much reflective, which doesn't really work with the ref. So, thanks. With the brush, you can make those adjustments very, very easily. Okay, so let's say this is the correct lighting. Not exactly. Maybe like that. Right, almost there. 
Okay. <clears throat> I can see that here, you see. This uh, shadow pattern helped me to define the correct uh, lighting direction. Okay, so I'm not too far. So thanks now to, to this, I can try to match as, as close as possible uh, the reference, which is easier if you have the same lighting condition. And uh, as you'll see in, um, in the full process, I, I'm sculpting most of the time from this point of view. Uh, and to make sure I can get back to it uh, very often, um, I'm just storing in this uh, texture palette a reference view here, store view. So now whatever I, I move, whatever angle of view I take, I just come, I can come back quickly to this angle of view. So next step was to bring on some details. Ooh, this is a pretty hideous. <clears throat> it works better like that. But um, my, my idea here was to exaggerate the details, especially with the brush materials, which, uh, uh, which give a strong feedback about the detail. Sometimes, sometimes you, you really have to, to be sure, for example, if I, if I go for a skin shaded, the details are, are less, uh, less obvious. Uh, so I wanted to have those, those details quite, quite strong so I can go back later. And this is often what I do. I, I'm going too far, I come, I come back, too far, I come back. And uh, this is a, an, iterative, uh, an iterative process. Okay, some more detailing now. I've started to remove a bit of those very strong details to, to go for something a bit more soft. Okay, I'll change a bit the pose. And it starts to have a lot of a lot of issue right now, but I'm not going to fix them right away. Because at that point I've I've started to deviate. I already I've already deviated from uh, the initial uh, reference because I I, I, I or at this stage I, I started to want to match uh, more of this kind of a of a figure style here, but uh, it was just the beginning of a very of quite of a long struggle. It's funny because I tend to to call my my uh, my five finals when they are absolutely not finals. So another step. Here I've just added poly paint, and uh, I'm using the skin shade as most of uh, of us do to to see my uh, my poly painting. So as you see, with with this sculpting process, to 2.5D in some uh, in some way, where I sculpt most most of the time from the same point of view, uh, the figure doesn't make much sense if you start to spin around. See, this is this is hideous. Uh, so now things start to become more interesting because I've started to block the um, the environment. So I had my composition I, as we as we saw in the in the uh, chapter. I think this was chapter three. No, chapter four. General linear overview. In chapter four, so I, I show you how, uh, after having a composition, I, I started to block in uh, with basic geometry, just to be able to send that to Keyshot or even here in ZBrush. And see all the same local value uh, 
uh, was working in shadow condition. And this is very important because um, to match uh, my abstract composition, I, I had to make sure that uh, if I wanted this to be, for example, the same piece of uh, furniture, it would make sense that they that it has the same local colors all around. And uh, so I wanted to see if, uh, if the, the shadow patterns were consistent. And uh, mainly that's, that was my concern. It was to have all these parts in shadow so I can have a mid gray value instead of a bright one here. So in this step, I've started to add a bit more details. Uh, so it was mostly about the fabric, I guess. And I, I keep moving from, um, you know, enabling poly, poly paint to disabling it, just to, to have different views of the same uh, the same image. So, for example, here, see, I, I still have those body paint informations, but I've just disabled those information to only see the, the sculpt. So, those are the, the different steps I've shown to you um, where I, I start to, to make something. With with this uh, with these figures that that start to match more of a of an academic academic style um, figure and uh, it's it's a it's a process where you know most of the time I'm doing I'm doing I'm doing shit I think but uh, hopefully there is there is this moment where I. I I'm able to see that something is not working, uh, and I'm I'm going through a lot of uh, of blind phases where I don't see that that this is not working with, because I'm too much caught in the process of of staring at the reference and maybe not enough at my model. So I'm I'm trying to match both, but something is not working in this model. But I at that moment I couldn't see it yet. So here, not much changes. Maybe the head. So here is the head. Here I have corrected the head. The head was just like some kind of placeholder at this place. And um, because of this approach where I try to sculpt in a 2.5D, uh, I really try to not put too much work unless uh, until it's really needed. So that's why up to that point, I just kept this this uh, this head this, this was more of a mock-up of a head now I've addressed that and um, I've tried to, to work a bit more uh, in a without um, symmetry but more in a symmetry in a symmetrical way and uh, this head doesn't work at all but it was it was just to have something at that moment but I I still had a lot of issue in that phase. Uh, I wanted to go for that very rendered, so I've tried to push that a bit too far because um, when um, you have the general proportion, just by going to, um, oh, it's not the correct uh, asset, just by going to your lower subdivision level, and I for those, I, I try to have a, a very low subdivision level because it makes it really easy, for example, with inflate brush to come in here and pressing Alt just to, to change the overall shape. So she's like maybe a bit too voluptuous, I would say, so I can just make her less, less voluptuous like that. And uh, once I'm going to go back into my division level, the the higher frequency details are going, are going to be projected on top of it. So it's very useful to have um, a low subdivision level, at least uh, for me in this process. So 
So this was step 12, step 13, detailing. Okay, so this is where I started to, to say, okay, um, I knew I couldn't really see what was really wrong with that figure at that moment, but uh, I decided to, to let it go for a while and uh, just have my, my eye and my focus, my attention um, uh, on something else. So um, this allowed me, when I come back to this figure, to, to all the ascendant, uh, see what uh, doesn't work. So this is very simple piece of furniture because uh, um, it's mostly like geometry placeholders. They they allow me on the sand to key shot to um, to be able to um, to apply different materials on them and to have uh, lighting references. And at some point, if I want to really change the, the shape or to add dramatic detailing it's possible because uh, i already have the correct values the correct uh, space um, space placement so I, I i knew at this point okay it's not not necessary to detail this uh, this piece of furniture much than that they, they are perfectly fine like that if uh, if they need more work i i'll do that uh, in 3d And I'm going to disable the injury story. Now the quick save because it's going to annoy me. Okay. So more detailing, bit more detailing, just a tiny bit. Okay. Yet on the furniture. So this is where I'm re retaking the figure. And I'm I'm trying different things. On, as I mentioned in another, in another part, I, I, I thought I thought <laughs> I can't believe when I watch that. I, honestly, I, I can't believe I, I've gone through that. This is this is so terrific. It's just terrific. And this is part of the process of just accepting my limitation and uh, who I am. You know, I know that this is working by iteration and keep coming back to the same thing um, that I end up seeing my mistakes and uh, and and that I, I'm able to, to make choices. And um, this is kind of a very weird process. Most of my friends uh, keep uh, telling me that I, I have a weird, uh, very weird process. But uh, at the moment, this is a process that works for me. Just be iterative. Don't spend don't spend too much time on uh, on the same thing. If it doesn't work, I just move to something else, and I I will come back later. And at some point, you know, maybe if I completely incapable of getting the correct shape uh, with that technique. Maybe I, I I'll go for asking a model to pose for me, and uh, a friend or, or a paid model, and photography that model and. Uh, Photo bash this photography in my painting because what I'm concerned about is to create an image that that tell a story and uh, I'm not concerned too much about technical details because it's kind of a problem solving problem solving uh, attitude uh, I'm just going at some point I, I I know that I'm going to find the right solution because uh, uh, I have to I have to when I have to put my ego just uh, behind, just a side of me, and accept that okay, if I don't have the the sculpting skills or the painting skill to do that this way, I'm just going to switch to another technique, because the techniques are here to to achieve a goal, and uh, this is what uh, matter for me. More retake, a very dramatic retake in this one. 
change a lot of things. This is the point where, where I decided, okay, this figure is just too awful. I already have to do something. So I just kept messing around and it was somehow, it was still not working, but it was closer. I think it was closer to what I wanted to achieve. And um, the arm is, is uh, too short, the head is too big, the, she's way too voluptuous here, but I was getting closer. Step 17. Okay, step 17. I'm pretty much here. Okay, so now this is this is starting to work. There is maybe under these lighting conditions, there is maybe still a bit of weirdness, but uh, with the correct uh, light and shadows patterns, which I keep referring to by sending uh, sending in to to the to a key shot, it was uh, it was kind of okay. And I just want to get close enough to that point where I'll be able, if needed, to uh, tweak the shape in Photoshop with a liquify, with warping, with a puppet warp, different tools, uh, and um, using using references and uh, asking eventually someone to, to pose for me. Uh, I, I knew that at that point I was close enough it was uh, it was almost satisfying, uh, even though it's it's very very far from being. Uh, sorry, it's not the correct button. From being the best uh, sculpt in the world. Okay, fifteen, seventeen, eighteen. Okay, so here's a point where I've started to spend a bit more time. On the fabric so at that point i just sent this uh, piece of geometry to um, to marvelous designer and i, I tried in a third time you'll see you'll see me do this uh, where is this piece this one and this one okay um there is two two way to, to quickly obtain something realistic um, using a Marvelous Designer. The first is just to send uh, your current geometry to Marvelous Designer, and this is uh, what this piece... <coughs> Let me put that solo. This is, this is it. I just sent the previous geometry I had here to Marvelous Designer. Uh, applied um, simulation and it folds just on itself and uh, this is way better than uh, what I had before and for example for for bringing just a bit of realism to your clothes or uh, if you have sculpted them on, on, in ZBrush and you just want to have a better overall uh, wrapping around your figure uh, you can just send quickly you will res mesh to, to ZBrush, to Marvelous Designer and reproject the details on top of it. And uh, most of the time for me, it's it's perfectly enough in my, in my process. Um, but in that instance, I found that it wasn't good enough. So I decided instead to do a full simulation with a, a square piece of a, of a garment in a Marvelous Designer. And uh, this gave me this simulation, which is a uh, way better and marvelous designer. It's just a marvelous uh, software, I guess. It's it's uh, it's so good. It's almost like if you were in in a in a studio and uh, and just putting a piece of fabrics on on things, and it does an, a wonderful job. And uh, I'm sure um, with correct reference. I'm sure one could sculpt something that uh, that precise, and the the old master used to do that. But they had uh, they had the, the model in front of them, and they, they were just uh, replicating uh, the real world. So when you have guesswork to do, uh, 
for me it's faster just to go into marvelous designer and have the the answer to my uh, to the solution to my problem so uh, here i i just start to to sculpt the armor i was using in that instance uh, those references that I had here. Where are they? This one and this one. Those were my two main references for this armor. And uh, I use them um, for for hard surface stuff. I use a lot of um, of a feature in ZBrush, uh, which is called um, don't even remember its name, but it works it works really great. Oh, oh yeah, panel loops. And uh, with panel loops, you can just define um, polygroups uh, by masking or by polypainting, and it will uh, split your mesh in several mesh and uh, extrude them uh, and add a bevel all around. So it's it's really great to, to create like different uh, piece of arm armors, jewelry, uh, all those hard surfaces that have uh, different layers uh, of uh, either adjacent geometry or, or layers, uh, I mean, one on top of each other, as it is the case in here. It's a really a cool, uh, a really cool feature and really easy to master. You have a lot of tutorial on the internet about how to use uh, to use panel loops. It's it's made to be easy to use and uh, really it is. And later I'm going to I'm going to split this armor, which I forget at the moment. Uh, either I forget or either I thought on uh, place that I would just split it later on. But I figured that if it was a two part are more, and if it would stand against the wall, uh, those two parts wouldn't be exactly uh, in the position like that. So at some point, I decided to, to split them apart to, to have the, the, um, the possibility to, uh, to, place, to place them really uh, as I wanted. Adding props. Leg plate, so I'm going to introduce you to the leg plates right in the scene where they are. Because this is, um, this start to be interesting at that point. Uh, for simple reason, and I think I'm going to maybe open a key shot, but uh, I hope it won't make my. Uh, Okay, doesn't need key shot at the moment. Okay, okay, I, I change my mind because I think there is um, important things to point relative to key shot, and uh, maybe you know it or not, but uh, key shot now comes in a special version for ZBrush, and uh, it's uh, very affordable. And there is a, a plugin. Oh. There's a plugin right in, um, in ZBrush, which allow you to send your geometry straight to, um, to Keyshot. And uh, it's really a great, great, great feature. Couldn't, uh, couldn't expect, expect more from, uh, from that sof software. And um, what I did very, very soon in my process was to define a camera. And uh, you see that I tested various, various uh, point of view. I can show you with different uh, focals. And finally, I came with uh, this one, which has a very long focal length. You see, it's, uh, it's 250, 250. It's, uh, it's almost... Uh, Orthographic is I, if I show you the difference with an orthographic camera, you see there is a bit of difference, but not that much. And uh, 
I really loved the way it was uh, creating um, a very calm composition. You know, it's it's very calm like that. So there is not too much tension, and uh, I, I really love that. So I decided to stick with uh, with that composition. So this scene is not the current scene, but what I usually do um, as soon as I'm making changes and uh, I really want to make sure of what they are going to look like in um, in Keyshot, I'm just sending my, my geometry. Uh, excuse, sorry, it's not, it's not the correct setting. So preferences. Um, no. Render, external renderer, key shot, and groups by materials. And something quite important in ZBrush to know if, if, is uh, if you want to be able to modify the materials while you keep the, um, the polypoint, you have to choose the flat color materials. If you don't do that, in fact, the the material informations, apart from the flat color materials, are going to be embedded into the the map, for, uh, into the color map. So you'll be bound to have the same uh, light direction and the same um, specularity and so on because in fact it's embedded in the um, in the color map. But anyway, for quick testing, you can perfectly use whatever whatever uh, material you want. You just have to send this to the brush, to key shot, excuse me. And it's a, it's a very easy way to test uh, your your placement in a in a Z brush, knowing that at some point when you know that you are happy with your three D geometry, or because you know that it's just a, a block out. It's something I do in, in other painting. It's just to have a block of geometry, which means it's something very, very rough. And I, I'm just finishing all of the image uh, in, um, in Photoshop. Uh, you can perfectly just come in here, you know, select this piece of armor if it's not in the right place and, uh, and move it like that. Uh, the uh, key shot, it is definitely not the best software to move things around because uh, the manipulators are, are very not user friendly, but for quick adjustments, it's uh, it's perfect. Okay, let's jump to the maybe the helmet, and you'll find the helmet and all those files. Uh, those separate assets that have been decimated, you'll find them in the in the ZBrush folder. So here's the ZMET. You can you can check the full sculpting process in the in the full process videos. So I just added a, a mock-up uh, head to be sure I had something uh, symmetrical. Uh, it's uh, July, so it's the default uh, July model that you can find here. I just kept her head. And I, I just use that as, as an underneath reference to make sure my uh, helmet will make sense uh, with an actual uh, uh, head anatomy. And if... Okay, now let's jump to the next scene. Okay. Um, at, at that point, you know, I was starting to to tweak the different elements and make force with key shot just to make sure um, I could have as precise placement as possible right into ZBrush because what uh, having this will offer is a straight pipe pipeline uh, workflow between ZBrush, key shot, and Photoshop which makes um, which makes it very very powerful because at any point later on and this is what I did because all of my uh, assets were correctly placed inside ZBrush and 
I was happy of the placement inside the key shot. It means that at, at any moment I can I can um, come back in here, make a rounder, drop another geometry, maybe maybe change that uh, that um, helmet of place, move it uh, somewhere else. Uh, as I did later, change the head of the sculpture, and uh, straight from ZBrush to Photoshop, there is a straight pipeline and it makes it uh, super powerful. But uh, for this to work, it's very important to have a working uh, a working composition that's been um, that's been um, validated before, and uh, and you're sure that it's not going to work. And there is other pipeline that you can uh, you can implement, like uh, for example rendering each uh, piece of geometry separately, and uh, adding the cast shadows by hand and the uh, ambient occlusion around. Uh, this way, you are you are very very free. You are almost free to to place your um, your elements inside Photoshop as you wish. And it's also a process I use a lot. But in this one, I I really wanted to have that level of, of precision. And uh, I want to show you maybe it's in here uh, where I started to fake to fake um, the um, the perspective. Let me explain you what I mean by that. Uh, as I said, uh, I've noticed since uh, a while that uh, 2D and 3D uh, are lying one, one to each other. What I mean by that is that is, uh, you can't completely rely on the truth of your 3D to make something work in 2D. Uh, most of the time, you, you're going to end up having Having trouble with your images, and uh, for example, if you if you look at this image, uh, those two pieces of um, of armor plates looks like they are very very close to the to the, the piece of the fabric, and and they are not. They are not, and um, there's many times where you you will have to cheat because the other frames that, that I have, because of the camera lens that I choose, uh, now you can see that there is almost no perspective, which means that this piece of armor looks like it's very too big. You know, intuitively, your mind knows that for this to be that close of you, the figure being here, this, are, this piece of armor has to be smaller. So even though it's not true from a 3D perspective, because I, I know I've I've just put this piece of armor of armor on top of her of her um, chest to be sure of the size. So I know in 3D in pure 3D it's the correct size, but it doesn't work from a 2D point of view. And later on I'm going to fake the perspective. Maybe I'm, I can show you this right now if I find find the correct uh, scene. So. I don't know if I'm going to go through all of this because I'm basically doing nothing here. So I'm going to open already the uh, scene trick part one. For for the rest of the sculpting process, uh, you, you you'll see that in the in the full process video. And uh, did I okay? And here I think after that to fake things. Okay, see. Those two pieces of uh, leg plates. Let me send two key shots to show you what I mean. Okay, here they are. Mm, from a composition standpoint, I wanted to have this piece here more straight, uh, less of a, on an angle, and uh, this one a bit more with a more pronounced angle, so the eye could go flow like that, go through the go through the helmet, and just slide on the leg plate like that, with a barrier made by by this other leg plate, and the eye will continue and maybe go through the fur rug. And through the the folds of the of the um, piece of uh, of fabric here, go through the fold and come back and just find this edge, 
I enjoy just go along, hop, find this uh, this piece of uh, oil lamp here, go through the shield, and because there's nothing here, it will have to jump what's, whatever you, it will have to jump to to here to her face, so it makes a circular uh, circular read. But to do that, I had to cheat. And uh, you can see that in, uh, in real 3D, those two pieces of uh, armor legs aren't uh, that close, but that they appear to be closer. If I'm opening the later one, so the se second scene trick. Okay, and here. I've started, I think, to cheat with this side of the, the okay, here I faked, I faked the perspective. And what I mean by that, I, I still wanted the viewer to feel like uh, they were a more pronounced focal length. And what a more, what a smaller focal length, which means uh, a greater angle of view, we uh, would do is to make this leg armor uh, looks uh, looks uh, bigger and this armor chest uh, looks smaller. So I just fake that manually because I, I was perfectly happy with the actual focal length in the composition. So I just change the the shapes, the overall size of the elements to make them uh, appear uh, of the correct size in a, in a 2D space. It doesn't look like much, but you see that it it brings a lot of uh, believability to to the image because right now this this armor is way too big. Okay, here we are. So now it looks like it has it has a decent size. And uh, those two pieces are bigger, they look closer, the helmet look a bit closer than her head. So it, it works way better like that. Okay, it's final tricks in final tricks UV. So I think from here, this steps 29 is going to be the very last. Yes, it is. And uh, here, what I did from the last, the last tool is to um, um, just change the, the overall uh, proportion of this piece of fabric here, because uh, the problem I had, and I, I shown you that in a, in the previous part of this lecture, um, is by going to my images, I made a few notes. This is the change that I did here, there. So you see the, the details were very, really confusing. There, there was uh, no good read about those details. It looks like just a bunch of a uh, of uh, of just nothing, just of, of ways. It doesn't, it doesn't lead the eyes. It doesn't participate into the composition. So at that point, I just change that and uh, change the, the overall proportion, you know. And here again, you can see that it, it really don't work uh, in 3D. Uh, you know, it doesn't look uh, believable. I think someone looking at, the, at this will instantly, instantly low, excuse me, I'm starting to be a bit tired. Um, you will know that there are some things that, uh, that don't work here, but uh, in 3D, I'm going to send that. In 2D, I mean, on sunscreen, it works.
And this is why having a strong composition from beginning is uh, really a life saving when you are in this, uh, this uh, mixed uh, 3D, 2D process, because you can really have the 3D to work for the composition and not the other way around, which is what I did for a very long time, was just mess around with 3D, uh, come with a nice uh, camera placement and, uh, and try to figure out a composition around that. But uh, I found that really thinking about the composition from the beginning is, a, is a, it's, it's time saving and uh, it, it's make for, for stronger result, I think. So, from here, um, I try to figure which, which one of those is the best to introduce the next part. Um, textures, okay, so I, I'll try to cover a few points <clears throat> from here. In Keyshot, I wanted to to be able to assign uh, specific materials uh, to specific uh, parts of uh, my models. Um, as I said before, there is the option where you're just making a rough uh, 3D pass and you're doing like a four, five, six, seven overall render pass with the same material assigned to the whole scene. And then you can compose your materials right into Photoshop, which is something I, I use often and, and works with. But in that particular matter, I really wanted to be able to assign the correct material to the shield, to the different parts. So what I did, if I select the shield, for example, which is actually just one materials, is just to, to split it in, a, in, in several materials. And it's something that you could, can easily do even on a decimated model, which uh, keep the, the, the different uh, the different islands, the different shell, I should say, 3D shells. So if you go into a polygroup and uh, auto group, you will Im immediately have um, Photoshop, um, ZBrush uh, splitting the different uh, parts. And uh, what I then did was to group all those by what I thought will be logical materials. So it means maybe this one, I'm going to group it like with this one and this one. I invert my selection, Control W to make one polygroup. Okay, it's done. So now I'm going to okay isolate it. And now I'm going to group, for example, all those little a uh, shell here, which has the same material, control W, so it's the same. Okay, I'm going to change the color. If you don't see, you can just come back and control W again. Okay, which is a uh, which is a uh, group together, and it will assign a separate color. And uh, once you're happy with your different uh, grouping, control W. Uh, the only the last thing that you have to do is just to okay in the rating part control W group together you just come it to your sub tool palette split and group split say okay and now you have your different uh, material split into different geometry. And when you're going to send that to, to Keyshot, you will be able to select any of those different parts and to assign the specific materials of, of them on them. So this is uh, one of the things I did. And it is also very important to make an ID pass. And an ID pass is, uh, is very easy to do. What, what you want to do, also you are happy with, your, with your, all of your geometry and all of your material split uh, as you wanted. You can just come into here, 
Mm, I'm wondering if I'm not going to do that. No, I think I'm going to, ferry, to cover that in here. Though you go for a flat material, I think that to your whole process, you unlink, unlink all the materials. So now you're going to have as much material as there are um, different uh, parts. And it's just a matter of coming into that material and I think assign random colors. Like that. And so on. So once you've splitted all of your materials and you are happy with your ID map, um, you can just render that at super high resolution because uh, what's cool with the flat render materials that it take very not that much um, uh, graphic card memory. So if you go into the option, go in advanced set control, you put a very low sample rate, don't know to have much samples, no ray bones, don't need it, anti-alias, it's for you to see, it depends on your on your um, final uh, render size, no shadows, no global illumination, no caustics, no sharp shadows, no global illumination cache, and now it's very easy to come here and just to, to render at 8,000 pixels if you want, and uh, if you have a decent uh, graphic card, uh, it should uh, even one with, with one gig of, uh, of RAM, it should work, which is going to create for you a very high resolution ID map that you can use uh, later in your artwork. Uh, 